our opening remarks, we have Dr. Shakobi Wilson. Um, once again, this is the seventh University of Maryland Environmental Justice Symposium hosted by the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health. Uh, Dr. Wilson, you can turn your camera on and we can get started. Yes, sir, let's get it. Okay, again, as, as Yan said, uh, welcome to the seventh day, the second day, well, it's not the seventh day, that'd be a lot of a uh, symposium, too much symposium there. The second day of the seven UMD EJ and, and Health Disparities uh, Symposium. Um, I'm happy to have everyone back today. I hope you enjoyed the first day. There were some great sessions um, uh, throughout the day and it got a lot of great feedback. I know we also got some feedback on a few tech issues and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, so to get started today, as I did yesterday, we want to you know, do a land acknowledgement. And so just you know, every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to, to this moment, to this day, to this time. Some predecessors were brought against, um, here against their will. Some were drawn to migrate from their homes in the hope of a better life of that, of that American dream. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. That's how we build solidarity. At SIEGE, the Center for Community Engagement and Environmental and Health, we create dialogue to honor those. We create spaces to honor those that have been historically and systemically disenfranchised. We acknowledge the fallen truths that are often buried. White supremacy has all but erased the existence, histories, and legacies of North America's indigenous peoples from American institutions, uh, the consciousness, and mainstream society. We at the University of Maryland College Park, our campus, we are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were, who were among the first to settle here in the Western Hemisphere. We are also on indigenous lands that were forcibly and violently taken from the Piscataway people by European colonists. That's a truth, that's a fact. We have to own up to that. And we wanna to try to uh, give balance to that. Through this land acknowledgement, we pay respects to the despite away elders and ancestors. However, we also wanna acknowledge that this is bare minimum owed to those uh, Piscataway peoples and all indigenous peoples. So we're gonna take uh, 30 seconds to consider this. We please take this moment to consider uh, the legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings together today. And also consider how we all can act, how you can act individually to reverse these legacies. So let's take about 30 seconds of silence. Okay, thank you. So a quick announcement. As, as I said, this is the seventh UMD EJ Symposium. The first one occurred in uh, 2012. We were in the uh, student union. We had about 500 participants, I believe that day, a lot of energy. We actually reached 1500 registrants. That's really exciting. So 1500 attendees. So this is our biggest symposium ever. I feel like it's gonna be the best symposium ever. So thank all of you for participating. Uh, those of you who showed up the first day, being back here the second day. And I really wanna thank our sponsors uh, who've been behind us every step of the way, uh, many sponsors over the years, particularly as we transition to this virtual environment. So a warm and sincere thank you to all of our sponsors, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, Maryland Conservation Voters, Chispa, Maryland, Earth Justice, the Sierra Club, Maryland Sierra Club, uh, UCS, Union Concerned Scientists, uh, Chesapeake Bay Trust, the Baja Chair, University of Maryland, uh, Choose Clean Water Coalition, Green 2.0, and also uh, the Center for Health and, and Environment and Justice, a CHEJ, a uh Johns Hopkins Environmental Engineering Department, the Rachel Carson Council, the Social Responsible Agriculture Project, uh, School of Public Health, 
and also all those individual donors, donors who, uh, who helped support uh, the symposium, not the symposium, uh, but also who supported um, Siege uh, from the beginning as a lab and now as we move forward uh, to impact these issues of environmental injustice as a center. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic back to Yen. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Uh, so going back to Dr. Wilson's mention of some tech issues that were experienced yesterday, uh, we've worked on what we can, and, and I have a few solutions to, to pose just to everyone generally really quickly um, before we go into our keynote for the morning. So I will share my screen now. And what I'm looking at right now is the Whova web app. Um, I'm actually looking at the page for this session. I access this by going to agenda and then sessions, and it should zoom you right to the active session. So from there, what we are doing today that we didn't do yesterday is once you go into view session, and it's gonna ask me if I wanna join and look at the, the window within here. This is still an option on Whova, but what we are also putting in the chat for each of these sessions, um, and, and sorry, I added it to the opening remarks, so let me back up a little bit. So we're in the opening remarks. So what we'll be going doing this morning is adding the actual Zoom link for each of this for, for each of the sessions. So this is the Zoom link for this morning's plenary as well as this afternoon's plenary. Um, ignore that. It'll give you an opportunity if you do want to join back in on the website, you can click join the stream. So this is the Zoom link that should get you in here. Um, additionally, it, we we have it here in the chat also. So the Q and A in the chat will have that populated for all of today's sessions. Um, you can use the meeting ID. If the link isn't working for you, you can use the meeting ID. Um, and just generally some tips for improving your Hoover experience this morning is or are update your browser to the latest version. So I'm using Google Chrome right now. And as you can see, I need an update. So look in your top right corner where these three dots are and it will tell you if you need to update. And so I will click update. I won't do it right now. But if you have that, click on that update button and it will update your browser. Similar format for Firefox, Safari. There is a known issue with Microsoft Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. So try not to use those. Um, additionally, if you're still having issues, try going into incognito mode. So to do that, hit those three dots again, and then go into new incognito window. If I click that, it gives me, you'll know you're in incognito mode because everything will turn dark. So once you're in incognito mode, your old browser will still be there. So just copy the link over and go to your incognito browser, hit paste, and hopefully that will get you in. Um, if you're having further issues, there might be something going on with your firewall or privacy issues in the browser. We'll try uh, send an email to Siege Center, C E E J H C E N T E R at gmail.com. I'll also put that in the link in the, in the chat. Send an email there and we'll, we'll do uh, all that we can to try and get you to the session. Finally, we've uh, most of the, the issues that folks were having, folks noted that when they tried on the mobile app, it worked out fine. So if you're able to, we're 100% aware that not everyone has a smartphone and not everyone will be able to download the mobile app. But if you are, and you're having issues with the web app, the mobile app might be your, your best solution there. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Wilson to introduce our 10th annual Siege Note Lecturer. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Thank you, Yan, uh, and, and thanks again for, for giving those instructions. And again, we apologize for the tech issues yesterday, but you know, we're in it in this world, y'all. This, this is the Zoom a Zoom world, and sometimes those things happen. So we appreciate we appreciate your grace and patience with us as we help provide this space for us to, you know, really focus on the issues that we want to focus on advancing the environmental justice. So as Yan mentioned, um, this is our 10th annual siege lecture. And today we'll have Dr. Cecilia Martinez speaking. Before I uh, provide more background, Dr. Martinez. I think it's really exciting that this is our 10th lecture. Um, you know, this lecture was conceived as, as an opportunity 
to give a platform to those who've been doing work in environmental justice and to, and to bring bigger attention to these issues at the University of Maryland and, and then to uh, give, give space to uh, folks who, who want to learn more about environmental justice to hear from folks who've been doing the work, right? Uh, icons out there, people who are doing the work locally. So this is a way to recognize them for their great work, but also, but also to give them opportunity to basically share what they, they're doing so others can learn from them. So we've had, you know, our first keynote speaker was Omega Wilson, one of my mentors from the Western Revitalization Association. We've also had uh, Lois Gibbs uh, from uh, Speak, right? We've had uh, Mustafa Ali, uh, Andy Fellows, uh, Fred Tubman, the production Riverkeeper. I think he's the only black river keeper in the country that's not really a good thing hopefully it's been more uh to this point um uh, we've also had you know dr dr robert bullard uh, uh be a keynote speaker uh vernice miller travis you know the ej icon who, who's done a lot of work from we act uh to to working in the foundations to doing work on planning and all, and all the great work she's been doing uh with with the met group uh washington uh group now and so this is a very important lecture for, for, for our center. And I'm really excited to see um, that we have Dr. Martinez today. And just to give a little bit of, of background, uh, Dr. Cecilia Martinez, the Senior Director for Environmental Justice uh, for the Council, um, uh, at the Council for Environmental Quality, CEQ. In this role, she will be facilitating the coordination of whole of government EJ agenda of the Biden administration. And it's one of the things I like to add, just as an interjection, you know, I, th I think this is a really important moment in time in the US and the fact that this administration has stepped up and emphasized environmental justice as a major priority, I think is really important. It's empowering for folks. So I just wanna share that and appreciate Cecilia's leadership uh, in, in that role. Previously, she was the executive director of the Center for Earth, Energy and Democracy, SEED. Uh, she also has held positions as a social research professor uh, in the College of Earth, uh, Ocean, and Environment at the University of Delaware. She has led a variety of projects to address sustainable development at the local, state, and federal level. Her work focuses on the development of energy and, and environmental strategies that promote equitable and sustainable policies. Uh, she received her BS degree from Stanford University and an MPA from New Mexico State University and her PhD from the University of Delaware's College of Urban Affairs and Public Policy. So I'm really, again, excited to have our keynote speaker here today, and I will uh, pass the mic to you, Dr. Martinez. Thank you so much, Jacoby. It is really an honor to be here with you all. And can I just say um, a huge thank you to Jacoby, Will Dr. Jacoby Wilson as well. Um, you know, Jacoby, I've been following you for many years, uh, relying on your research and work in the environmental justice community. And I think um, I can speak for a lot of people who say it's people like Dr. Wilson, Dr. Bullard, a whole array of environmental justice community members on the ground, their long struggle that really gets us to the point that we are today. Um, and so while I occupy this seat at the Council for Environmental Quality, um, just as uh, Dr. Wilson talked about the land acknowledgement, um, it would I would be very remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this position has is the result of decades of struggle um, from our most vulnerable communities and from environmental justice advocates and researchers for quite some time. So um, I really appreciate this time to be able to share with you some of the things that are going on as Dr. Wilson, indicated um, I come from a community-based organization um, that worked on environmental justice. We were an organization that worked on policy and technical analysis to support environmental justice communities. Um, and now I am in government. I am at the Council for Environmental Quality. And um, it was a decision that was uh, both difficult but also promising. And I and I wanna start at the outset to say that because um, as Dr. Wilson indicated, this administration's uh, environmental justice agenda is historic, um, but it's not an accident. It is because throughout both the campaign and through uh, the transition and through the development of uh, climate and environmental agendas, 
Um, there was an extensive outreach to environmental justice communities for, for many months. Um, and I think it shows. I think the kind of things that I'm going to share with you about the initiatives that are ongoing um, demonstrate that there was listening and that our communities were able to have a critical input into how uh, this administration's environmental and climate work uh, will happen. And so today I will uh, focus a bit on some of the major uh, initiatives that the administration is undertaking. Um, Shikobi, I'm thinking that possibly you did want to have room for questions. So hopefully I will be able to get through this and maybe have some questions. Is that is that right? It's up to you uh, if you want questions. Uh, if we have time for it, cool. If not, I, I think it's fine, but it's up to you, okay? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, let me start by saying, I know in, uh, I'm in some way preaching to the choir, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't at the outset, south, outset state that the evidence is out and it is clear that the climate crisis is one of this country's biggest environmental threats. Uh, the consequences of climate change are already being seen through uh, a number of issues and environmental um, events. Um, we have seen, for example, uh, that the natural environment, um, such as the modifications in species migration patterns and loss of biodiversity, Shifting chemical composition in air quality, which will most definitely affect our most vulnerable communities, and a whole host of other known and as yet unknown impacts are part of the existential problem that we have uh, called climate change. Um, the consequences, as we know, are also being felt in the human environment. As we witness increasing frequency and severity of weather related disasters in our own country, you all are seeing and experience firsthand these impacts in the research that you do and in the communities that you work with. And I just want to point to a couple of recent examples. These are by no means the only examples, and I know you all know many, many more in your work. But these recent examples tell the tale that the impacts of climate change are of concern today, and it is not just a concern for the future. I know we are all aware of that. Wildfire season, which we are in the middle of, are growing longer and more devastating. In June of this year, the national preparedness level, which runs from a scale of one to five, was raised to a four. In the past years, 2002, 2008, and 2012, are the only previous fire years where the PL was, where the, the, that preparedness level was increased to four during the month of June. We are seeing this with incredible frequency. And we cannot escape the fact that many of our most vulnerable communities are caught in the crossfires of these wildfires. The heat, dryness, and drought conditions out west is feeding the wildfires all across the state. But as we know, many of the effects of climate change are global. In Europe, unprecedented rain has resulted in massive deadly and destructive flooding in Western Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and is being described as the worst European disaster in more than a century. In Greenland, as we recently saw in the news, its ice sheet summit had unprecedented rainfall for the first time in recorded human history. Permafrost, melt in Alaska is affecting whole villages that rely on subsistence food and cultural practices. Now, while it's too early and we know that we can't say that climate change is the cause for these particular events, the trend we know is quite clear. These events are becoming more common and more severe. Now, the point of this summit and this conference of particular concern, as we all know, is the impact that climate crisis is having and will have on environmental justice communities. Environmental justice communities historically have been on the front line and the first to experience all kinds of environmental risks and harms. 
These are indigenous communities and tribal communities, communities of color and low income communities. And it's well known globally, a 2017 United Nations report from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs presents a very clear picture of the impacts of climate change on, tradition, on these communities. In addition, the US's fourth national climate assessment released in 2018 and prepared by a team of more than 300 experts, including some of our environmental justice colleagues and researchers, predicted that climate change would continue to disproportionately affect environmental justice communities in both urban and rural areas, unless we act to address, address this through our institutions and our systems. So we know that the disproportionate impacts of climate change on these communities is already being experienced and has been for quite some time. People without access to quality housing with sufficient insulation and air conditioning have greater exposure to heat stress. People who work on frontline jobs in agriculture, for example, are the least protected and the most exposed. Similarly, those without affordable energy during extreme cold snaps are relegated to highly unsafe practices to keep their families warm. Those that have traditionally had a hard time recovering from disasters will face even more greater challenges recovering from future events and mitigating against these future disasters. The health infrastructure and economic related impacts will exacerbate these uh, what these groups experience already. And this, we know, is what racism and social inequality looks like in the United States of America. So there is a long history of considering the environmental justice implications of not only of climate, but of environmental policy in general. That is why people like Dr. Shacoby, Dr. Bowler, Dr. Sheets, Dr. Wright, Peggy Shepard, Michelle Roberts, et cetera, have been doing their work for decades and decades. But we have no choice now, if we ever did have a choice. We have to address the environmental injustice and the environmental justice ramifications of relocating whole communities and infrastructure Examples like Albany, Georgia, and similar considerations are required for indigenous communities and infrastructure relocations in Alaska. With Puerto Rico and Hurricane Maria, we witnessed how our most vulnerable communities struggle more than others in their recovery efforts. And for many communities, these severe weather events, even as far back as Katrina and longer, are still struggling to achieve normalcy. With that, as a country, we must continue to look for ways to assess the impacts that our federal agencies programs are having on these communities, both in the short term and in the long term. We know that there is an interrelationship between the climate crisis and social inequality. And this interrelationship requires us to tackle them together. And that is why I think with extensive environmental justice input, President Biden issued Executive Order 14008. 14008 is called Tackling the Climate Crisis of at Home and Abroad. And this order confirms the administration's commitment to tackle climate change and at the same time secure environmental justice by spurring economic opportunity for our communities that have been historically marginalized and overburdened by pollution and that have been underinvested in, in housing, in transportation, in water and wastewater infrastructure, in healthcare, in energy, across all the different infrastructure investments. We know that communities have been underinvested in sometimes unintentionally, and sometimes as we know, very intentionally. So in executive order 14008, the 
president asks the chair of the Council of Environmental Quality. Today, I'm very honored to serve under Chair Brenda Mallory, uh, the first African-American woman to serve as the chair for the Council on Environmental Quality. But under the executive order, the president asked Chair Mallory to lead the, inter the Environmental Justice Interagency Council. Now, this is the first establishment of a whole of government interagency council. That body is tasked with the responsibility for developing and for implementing the federal government strategy to address environmental injustice. Now, this Environmental Justice Interagency Council has already met and continues to meet and makes recommendations to the chair, its executive director, is uh, the Deputy Director for Environmental Justice at CEQ, Corey Solo, at the moment. Um, and we have met with agency leaders and environmental justice officers to delineate the steps to meet the EO's mandate. We know that the EO and the kind of work that is happening in this administration is transformational. It is shifting all agencies to integrate fully and to look at how environmental justice and their programs will deal with the most underserved and vulnerable communities in this country. And this will be a critical council for ensuring a coordinated federal family strategy to address environmental justice and equity. I wanna name two important things that are going on in that, I, what we call IAC. First of all, we know that there is a precedent. There used to be the Environmental Justice Interagency Working Group that was established by Executive Order 12898 uh, by President Clinton in the early 90s. That interagency working group was convened by EPA, has done a remarkable work, uh, a level of staff commitment um, throughout the administration, even when there wasn't support for environmental justice work. Uh, the dedication and the commitment of staff within agencies who have environmental justice as a passion and commitment was extraordinary. And so one of the things that we do not want to do by establishing the IAC is lose that history, that knowledge, and the incredible, incredible commitment that many of the staff in these agencies have delivered oftentimes and sometimes without any resources to do the work. So right now we are working also to make sure that those staff who have been a part of the interagency working group continue to be a part of this new elevated interagency council. What makes this council a little different is first of all, it is convened by the chair of CEQ rather than a specific agency, which means it can look and have a bird's eye view and look at the whole of government, all agencies that are working on environmental justice. Secondly, it requires that each agency that are members of the IAC deliver and have a member that is at the deputy secretary level of each agency and a member that is the senior staff level at each agency. The reason for this, I'm sure you all are, are, uh, would know, is that by having a member at the deputy secretary level, we are ensuring that the strategies at each agency are being looked at at the highest levels of that agency and to ensure evaluation and monitoring and carrying out of an environmental justice agenda. And of course, as I've mentioned, the senior staff level is critically important because these are the people who continue to do the work, who will make the IAC durable and institutional, even as administrations change and political leadership changes. So this IAC is critically important. It is essentially to have a fully coordinated whole of government approach to environmental justice. And I can say just in the meetings that I've been in both at the IAC, but also on one-on-one -on -one meetings with agencies and their deputy secretaries and their senior staff who are working hard to look at how their agency should address environmental justice. I can say that there is a whole commitment and passion to figuring this out. 
people are working hard on some very difficult questions about how to integrate environmental justice. As I mentioned before, this is transformational. So as we all know, transformation is more than just incremental change. It requires wholesale change. And that is hard. And it may take a little time, but if we set the foundation right, then we can continue to build on it and make it durable. And then I think that is what CEQ's goal is right now. Well, a second um, part of the administration's environmental justice agenda is that the president also directed CEQ to convene a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And this is a federal advisory committee. It is the first ever federal advisory committee at the White House level, at the executive office level, that will advise the president and the White House around environmental justice issues. Members of the WEJAC are drawn from across the political spectrum, with ex but the most important qualification for a WEJAC member is that they have experience in or knowledge of environmental justice in relationship to climate change, disaster preparedness, across all the different agency uh, programmatic missions. Now, as you can imagine, there are a my rate of people in this country that have the expertise and could be part of the WEJAC. This was a very difficult process in that we wanted to make sure that we had regional diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity, issue diversity um, in developing the membership of the WEJAC. This is the first membership and we know that it will continue to grow. And as uh, members uh, continue to serve out their term, that new individuals with extraordinary expertise will continue to be part of this WEJAC. I can tell you that, um, as I mentioned before, in all of the agency conversations that I have, the WEJAC is always looked at by agencies as an essential uh, committee and council to get recommendations from, to seek advice from, to seek consultation from. And so I'll get um, into some of what they've done in just a moment. Um, but uh, just to move on from this, I wanna share that the WEJEC was stood up at the end of March. Uh, by mid-May, uh, the WEJEC provided approximately 90 pages of recommendation to the chair of the Council of Environmental Quality and the president on initiatives in the federal government, including the Justice 40 initiative, which, we'll, which I'll talk about in a moment, the revision of EO 12898, and on the climate and economic justice screening tool. The dedication and the commitment of these WEJAC members was extraordinary. In that short amount of time, about two and a half months, they met nightly, they met on weekends, they divided into working groups, to develop the most uh, significant recommendations that they could in terms of moving forward um, on these initiatives. And why that is important is I wanna share that at CEQ, at least in my role, I believe that we have to practice and model the kinds of advice that we are offering agencies across um, all the federal family on how to address environmental justice. One of the most Premier things that we know that is an environmental justice principle is, well, we speak for ourselves. And secondly, that environmental justice communities need to be on the ground floor of the development of any policies or programmatic initiatives. The reason we asked the WEJAC to provide their recommendations so quickly was because we wanted to have those as the ground floor, the baseline from which we then began to work with agencies on the development of these different initiatives. And it's been a success. I can say that these baseline recommendations we are using in all the major initiatives that we are in charge of at the EQ. Moreover, we constantly get requests from agencies, from agency leadership to make, to ask how they can engage the WEJAC, how they can consult with the WEJAC, 
and how they can continue to keep them informed about the latest issues that are popping up around their agency issues. So I think the WEJAC has become an important body, but I would be remiss, just like I said before, not to talk about the historical, um, the history of how the WEJAC came into being. The National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which was a FACA that was convened and is convened by EPA, continues to function. That NEJAC has provided incredible recommendations and reports to EPA, not just about EPA programs, but about how the federal family should operate with respect to environmental justice. I know Dr. Wilson has been a member of the NEJAC and is. That I think has become the foundation um, for how we can begin to create the WEJAC and move the WEJAC forward in its agenda. The other thing I would like to mention is um, moving forward, most obviously, we want the NEJAC and the WEJAC. I know these are crazy acronyms, but the NEJAC and the WEJAC to be able to communicate and work together and to figure out how we continue to embed environmental justice recommendations in the other agencies that don't have agency-specific factors on environmental justice. So again, a very historic moment. Um, it's something that the environmental justice community has been asking for for quite some time, to have environmental justice elevated to the White House. And this is, um, very positive steps in that direction. A third area which I would like to share with you is obviously one of the most premier initiatives that I think you all have heard of, but if not, please, please review the WEJAC recommendations and um, materials that are coming out of the White House, and that is the Justice 40 initiative. So in Executive Order 14008, the president also stated and published that what we want to do in this administration is invest 40% of the benefits of certain federal programs directly to the most vulnerable communities in this country. These benefits should be in the areas of clean energy and energy efficiency, clean transportation, affordable and sustainable housing, pollution reduction, training and workforce development, and the development of clean water and waste infrastructure. Very important areas that many of our communities have been underserved and underinvested in for quite some time. The Justice 40 initiative is a critical part of how we address the systemic biases that have happened historically, not just in the federal government or in state and local government, but in the private sector as well. It is a whole of government approach to advancing environmental justice. And we have already at CEQ been working with agencies on how we can meet this goal through the delivery of the programs that are part of these agencies. We are working in concert with the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and the National Climate Advisor, um, Tina McCarthy and her team, to make sure that Justice 40 is as effective as we can make it, that it's as transformational as we hope it, we want it to be, um, and that um, we actually get and monitor and evaluate uh, for accountability purposes that that 40% investment benefit does get to the communities that we want to get it to, um, and that we institute an evaluation and monitoring process that will ensure that. Again, transformation is difficult and it's hard. It, will, it requires agencies right now, and they have been directed to do this, to review their programs, all their programs within their agency, to identify all the programs, that we would be covered under Justice 40, to assess what is there to deliver a plan about how they would engage with communities around implementation of Justice 40, what kinds of changes to the program to programs, existing programs 
might be needed in order to effectively implement Justice 40? What kinds of legislative changes might be needed in order that they can deliver their programs in the way that Justice 40 is intended? And so all that information, agencies are now being asked to deliver and to provide OMB, CEQ, and the Climate Policy Office. As we review that data through that interim guidance, we will develop a fuller guidance for agencies on what and how they should move forward on implementation of Justice 40. Again, we want to make sure that the programs that and the guidance that we give agencies are going to provide a solid foundation that will be durable, not just for this year and for next year, but for the next administration and for the administration after that. And so we are really excited. It's hard work to get Justice 40 moving and implemented, but it's important work. And I know agencies are all committed of the staff and the senior staff and the deputy secretaries that we've been working with. There is a, a commitment to make sure that this, this happens in the way that we, that we want it to and we intend it to. And so another effort that is related to Justice 40 um, is the development of a climate and economic justice screening tool. Two things that are needed for effective implementation of Justice 40. One is identifying which communities should be covered by Justice 40. In other words, identifying what in the executive order is called disadvantaged communities. We know that that language is problematic and we've been working to figure out how to uh, uh, modify that language that it more appropriately describes the kinds of communities that we're talking about in Justice 40. But nonetheless, a critical component of Justice 40 is to make sure that we identify for agencies which communities they should be targeting, which communities fall under the rubric of Justice 40. And for that, um, we are we're in the process of developing a climate and economic justice screening tool that would do that for agencies. It would be a geospatial application that would help visualize those communities that would be the recipients of Justice 40 investment benefits. I'm sure you all know the incredible value that geospatial tools have in understanding the reality of communities through both qualitative and quantitative data. And so this tool will be used to identify the communities across the country that should be covered. And we hope and plan that moving forward, this tool, which we're, the acronym is CGEST, um, will encompass not only climate and environmental justice indicators like pollution and emissions, but also other indicators related to, for example, transportation, energy, and socioeconomic justice. Now, again, I think you all know, and many of you are researchers, that, by, that getting accurate data that, is, um, that we are able to do national comparison, but is also granular enough to make sure that we get reliable and valid um, identification of communities, um, is, is a feat. EJ Screen um, was developed by EPA. Um, we know that, that that screening tool is a very important tool that both agencies and communities use. But the difference between EJ Screen and this new tool is that this new tool will be responsible for identifying for agencies the actual allocation of investments across the federal family. And for that reason, you all know, we have to create a tool that is of the highest quality, that is defensible both in terms of scientific purposes, in terms of policy purposes, but also we know that we need to make it sure that it is defensible across the country as different political situations arise and make sure that we can continue to implement Justice 40 in the way that we want without having to answer to or to um, that we have it in the best possible quality. Um, and so that climate and economic justice screening tool, the WEJEC also provided significant recommendations around. 
Um, they offered up a number of data sets and data ideas to us about what they think should be crucial in developing the tool. What I will say is because of the immense uh, power this tool has, what we are looking at at the moment is standing up a tool, a phase one tool that can help agencies get those investments out the door and prioritize. Um, and then a phase two process of the tool, again, modeling and practicing what environmental justice means is to have further engagement with environmental justice communities and other allied stakeholders on what are the critical other data sets that need to be included um, as we move forward. Um, so we're looking at the climate and economic justice screening tool as a phased process to ensure that it is of the highest quality and that it meets the needs of both community and government agencies. As part of this, including community perspective is crucial, we all know that, to achieving Justice 40's initiatives goals. And finally, I just wanna say that a last component of the agenda that we're working on is a revision of Executive Order 12898. Um, that is the hallmark. You know, we all know, all of us who work on environmental justice know that that executive order signed by President Clinton in the early 1990s has been the executive order that guides environmental justice in the federal family. Again, in uh, written and established in the early 1990s, it's time for that executive order to be updated modernized, revised to meet the 21st century challenges and to also undertake and acknowledge the immense progress since the early 1990s of a great deal of work in environmental justice at the community level, at the state and local level, in the federal family level, in the research arena, we need to modernize both the tools and the language of EO 12898 to address where we are today and to help this federal family move forward into the 21st century about how they deal with environmental justice issues. And so we are actively working. We use the WEJAC recommendations on their, uh, their recommendations on the revision as a baseline. We are talking with every single agency who is a member of the Interagency Council to get their feedback on what are the critical points they see that are important to a revision and what is the best way that uh, an executive order can be fashioned to ensure, again, the durability that environmental justice continues um, throughout administration. Um, that process, um, and as that draft EO uh, moves further along, uh, that will be forwarded again to the chair of the Council of Environmental Quality who will then forward it to the uh, climate policy officer, Gina McCarthy, and together um, forward on to the White House um, and the president's team for uh, development. We have uh, spent a considerable amount of time making sure that we get both community input as well as government input into this executive order, because what we want is an order that will again Stand the legal test, but also be able to deliver on the goals and the vision of what environmental justice should look like in the federal family. Um, and so with that, um, I will stop there. Um, Shakobi, it looks like we may have a few minutes for questions. I'm not sure how you want to handle this. No, no. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Thank you for that that great tent uh, siege lecture. The the overview. I mean, so much information that you provided about what's happening with this administration. As you said, uh, hopefully everyone heard. Like, there are some phenomenal, transformative, historic things this administration is doing. As Dr. Martinez mentioned, just I mean, the fact that she's in her position is historic, right? Um, the fact that we have WeJack is historic. The, the two executive orders, the one on climate change is historic, Justice 40 is historic. I mean, this is the moment, this is the time. So hopefully folks were taking notes. 
I know uh, we have a few questions for you and we have a, a few minutes for questions. And so I want to give a shout out first to you, Dr. Martinez, and your great work. And, and the fact you were able to transition or, 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 or for a crossover from community organizing to the government. That's how we say the <laughs> to government, right? Uh, the policymaking, right? So, so you're, you're blazing the trail for other community leaders, right, to follow. Are, are there going to be more positions created for this purpose? Uh, and, and so what's the roadmap for this? Because I think this is what we want to see more of. I mean, putting the, uh, you know, the making democracy work, it takes work, but putting the democracy in the hands of people who are on the front lines and fence line, I think is the way to go. So can you respond to that? Yes. First of all, let me just say that it's already happening. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I get an email from somebody in an agency that we all know <laughs> that has been working on these issues and, and sort of, and, and they're there now. Um, and so there is a critical mass that is forming of folks who, who both have been working in this area, but also who have the incredible commitment and passion to make sure that it moves forward. So I, that was actually an incredibly positive, I wouldn't say surprise, but it just, it, 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 it's an enormous feeling to be able to see across the agencies, um, fellow people, both, you know, across all of the agencies who are bringing that expertise and, and that knowledge. But, but in addition to that, I think your point is well taken. And I would, and I would ask this too, is, you know, I think, you know, there, 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 we have a history. Obviously, we have a history of, um, of not being heard in previous, you know, federal government administrations of um, trying to figure out our place of pushing of uh, making sure that our, our ideas and our realities are put into practice in terms of um, a federal uh, initiative. And so I think there was there is also this period of wait and look and see. Um, is this administration being sincere? Is it going to do the things that it promised during the campaign? And I know a lot of friends um, and colleagues who who were asked to join and 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 said, well, you know, I don't know. I need to figure this out. I need to see what I would say too as this administration continues to build out its position, to please, please, those of you who do have an interest, who want to make a difference, I think there is a critical mass of us now in the administration who want to do the best possible job that the federal government can do um, to, to work in the areas of that we're talking about, but also to meet the needs of this country. Ooh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. So a, a follow-up question for you. You mentioned uh, 12898 at the end. Can you give us an update on, you know, will this, will these revisions, if you can give us an update, will they look at, will they include cumulative impacts? Will they include some NEPA changes? What about, you know, Title VI? And also this is there's this movement out there called the Green Amendment, where folks are trying to change state level constitutions that you have a right to clean air, clean water, you know, I'm not sure that you know about the Green Amendment, but I just want to add, like, like these rights, like we should have a right to clean air, clean water, you know, a safe food mm -hmm. and safe transit, right, safe housing. So, can you speak to a little bit about what's happened with with the revision, with the changes? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, so, so there are two parts to the revisions that we. So, number one is, um, you know. It's figuring out how we can be as innovative and bold in the in the new executive order as possible, keeping in mind that it's an executive order, right? Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we've also enlisted, to your point earlier, um, friends and colleagues in the administration who have deep history in both environmental justice and the executive order to help us think through what should be included in the executive order. Um, what should be included as leverage points and what should be included explicitly in language um, through the executive order. Some of what you've mentioned are important issues, you know, without getting into the legality of jurisdiction, et cetera, but you know that NEPA is under the jurisdiction of CEQ, Title VI, DOJ, you know, so 
making sure that all of those things work together. And that's why we have been so intentional of making sure that we work with agencies to figure out what's the best way to put it in the language and where some other areas of ensuring those issues move forward should happen, um, whether it's in regulation or other areas. And a second part of that is also, in addition to the executive order, we're looking at, well, what, what should be a guidance to agencies, maybe not in the executive order itself, but a guidance to agencies about how to implement the executive order, which can get much more detailed um, in terms of what is expected. Because part of also what we're looking at, which I know you <laughs> have been pushing um, uh, for a long time, Jacoby, is you know what's the accountability? So, all right, how do we monitor and make sure that agencies are being accountable and delivering on what is in the executive order? So that's that part of it. The green amendment, I actually, that is new and I would love to hear more from you about that. So please let's let's have a conversation about that and, and figure out what those, yeah, what that is and how that looks. Yeah, it's not something that I'm leading, but I was on the panel recently and I think there's this energy at the state level, uh, and we can share more information about it. Where they try, they're trying to change constitutions and say you I mean, put it in, you have a green, uh, uh, put the green amendment to these constitutions, and said, is that is that something that we could look to as a, as a platform, as a model for some of these from this other work that we're trying to do uh, through through you know CEQ. So I just wanted to put that in as a as a potential thing to look at. Uh, the next question, I, I think there's a lot of energy. And again, this is exciting work and again, a, a great overview from you, uh, but all, that's a lot of stuff that y'all are doing. Just to, just want to, I mean, so we really commend your work, CQ's work, the, the, the WeJack, you're sending people meeting, you know, nightly, on, you know, on the weekends, putting work in. That's EJ, y'all, letting uh, folks, uh, you know, the, the principles, if you don't know the 17 principles of environmental justice, principle five and principle seven, both of those principles talk about people speaking their own voices and those most impacted being engaged in decision making. That's what you have here with what with, with Celia and Dr. Martinez is talking about. Uh, next question for you is Justice 40, you know, uh, the resources from the infrastructure bill. How, what is CAQ doing to make sure, you know, these frontline fence on communities? And you talk about the, 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 the tool, right? You're market targeting communities, but then the folks who in the communities are actually doing the work. So, because I think at that core, what we're talking about with environmental injustice is economic injustice. So, how are you working to really? Uh, you know, through Justice 40, uh, address economic injustice to create new economic opportunity structures for folks. And, and how can people who are listening take advantage of Justice 40, bring Justice 40 down to the state level and to the county level? I'm not just asking like five questions, but you can yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but, but they're all they're all critical questions. So let me let me take a couple of steps. One is um, w one of the pieces in terms of us working with agencies. Um, and they're having their own conversations internally and developing incredible ideas, is what an, is needed at the ground level to make sure that communities have what they need to be or able to access these resources. So there are deep dive conversations happening in agencies about what is, how they need to shift their programs a bit, what kinds of technical assistance, capacity building assistance in the grants or in the investments can be developed in order to ensure that there's broader participation, how grant uh, applications can be modernized or made a bit different so that communities that don't have the incredible grant writing technical assistance are able to access these resources. So all of that thinking is happening um, right now to make sure, to, to your point, that, that the communities themselves can access this. How to build relationships with community-based organizations that have the most direct relationships with our communities and, and, and work with them on building out just the 40. So that's, that's one component. I think there's also um, what I've seen is a number of initiatives that are trying to work also at the state level um, working with, you know, I think uh, the most recent example I've heard is the National Caucus of uh, Black State Legislators, who's working and trying to work with states about how they can implement at the state level oversight mechanisms to make sure that Justice $40 in those states get to the communities that they want. And I also have heard a lot about philanthropic initiatives as well. 
jumping in and trying to figure out how to align their resources with Justice $40. So here we have, you know, folks working at the state level, we have private philanthropy, we have federal government all thinking the same thing. How do we make sure that communities are able to access, access these resources? Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> I think uh, that's our last question. Uh, we, we'll try, would it be possible if, if there were other questions we can send them to you if we maybe get response to you to those Absolutely. questions? Thank you for that. No, thank you for this wonderful uh, lecture. Perfect speaker for a perfect moment. I mean, this is a really important moment in time. Uh, I think uh, I speak for all of us because I know we can't do the uh, uh, clapping function. Okay, people can't clap, but I speak for all the attendees that that was a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, Yan, you got the clapping function. You can, you can just do that real quick for us, the audience clap. I don't have it pulled up, but but here's this. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Martinez. We appreciate your time today. Uh, hope to hear from you more uh, from WeJack and about the about the tool. You know, I love mapping tools and I love accountability. You yeah. know, that's my that was my knee jack soapbox. Follow track the money know. and accountability. So I appreciate hearing all that. But thank you again for your time and uh, maybe you'll be able to attend some other sessions and and just listen in. But again, th thank you, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Jacoby. Hang in there. Thank you to everyone. Okay, Yan, yeah, back to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martinez, for that great opener to today's sessions. I'm gonna do a run through of what we have ahead of us today. And so, <clears throat> going by the numbers here. So we just had our first our, our, our first plenary of the day. Um, going into our first block of concurrent sessions, we have environmental justice, industrial, animal, agricultural, and rural communities. Uh, that's session 1A. Session 1B, the Mid-Atlantic Environmental and Economic Justice Coalition. This is a new coalition. Um, so that's session 1B. Sorry, 1A and this is 1B. 1C, legislative listening session, fence line and frontline community priorities. This will be a session where, where the audience will be able to submit questions if you haven't already through the chat function in Whova. Please submit, submit your questions for our delegates uh, to, to answer for this session. And then the last session in the morning uh, block will be intersectional environmental justice, environmental justice, racism, stress, and health disparities. And that'll be session 1D before we break for lunch from, um, I think that that break for lunch will be at 12.30 and then we'll come back 30 minutes later at one o'clock. We've got two more blocks of concurrent sessions there, fighting for food sovereignty in the DMV, a session specifically on Justice 40. So hear more about what Dr. Martinez was, was discussing earlier in her keynote. Uh, environmental racism, incarceration and toxic prisons in the US. The environmental justice dynamics of warehouses, electrification, and air pollution, and a demonstration of the My Block Counts comprehensive community block assessment tool uh, given by our very own Joseph Galarraga. For the third block of sessions, we'll have our 30 years on youth leaders' reflections on being raised in the EJ movement. That's definitely one that you don't want to miss but you might have to because we have the concurrent sessions. Just as a reminder, all of our sessions will be recorded and, and available on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll have a, a session specifically on NEJAC, which was also mentioned in the keynote. We will have an, a session on equitable and affordable housing in the DMV. And then finally, our afternoon plenary will be donors of color, the, the donors of, of color network presents getting EJ funded. Um, 101. And so that's what, oh, and then we have as a special treat, a, a second afternoon plenary, Voices from the Fence Line, Leadership and Resistance in Cancer Alley. So we'll be streaming some clips from filmmakers Stiv Wilson and Megan Ponder of the Peak Plastic Foundation um, with a panel discussion from community members in, in Cancer Alley. And so that will round us out for the day. We do not have a speed networking session for, for today. Thank you, very, very grateful for those of you who participated last night. Um, and, and 
I believe that's all there is to say for right now. We're finishing up actually about five minutes early. So we can, we our next sessions will begin at 11.20. So I encourage you all to actually jump over to Whova and just familiarize yourselves with the platform. If you didn't participate yesterday, please jump on to the Whova platform. Uh, I will drop this link in the chat again for anyone who might have missed it. Um, and, and for anyone who might have logged in late, I guess this is a good opportunity for me to go over again. If you were in the sessions yesterday and you, you were experiencing some difficulties, some ways to head that off are to use the mobile app. If you have a smartphone and, and you're able to use the mobile app, uh, many of our, our registrants were saying they weren't having any issues with the mobile app. Additionally, try using a different browser. If you're using Firefox, try Chrome. If you're using Chrome, try Safari. Um, we do know that there are known issues with Microsoft Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. So try not to use those um, browsers. Stick to, I think Chrome is the preferred um, that, that for, for using Whova. Um, and then finally, we have added, I have, I've gone through and added the links to each of the Zoom sessions. So if you're, if you're not getting anywhere um, in, the, in your browser, you can click on this link. It'll open up a Zoom window. Um, and you can access the session that way. If you have any questions throughout the day, you can leave messages in the chats here. You can send messages to me on Whova directly. If you're having uh, issues accessing Whova at all, send an email to Siege Center, that's C E E J H Center at gmail.com. And I am putting that in the chat as well. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Cecilia Martinez. I think at this point, we'll take the few extra minutes, um, grab coffee, grab a bagel, and we'll see everyone in the first block of sessions at 1120.